As many of my regular followers know, the core goal of this YouTube channel is to try and get video games taught in academia. I do this by seeking out the most profound narratives in the medium of games, mining them for their philosophical, psychological, and mythological content. Then I present them in an easily digestible format in the hopes that the right people see them. I do this because, unfortunately, video games ask more of their consumers than movies or books do. They are often expensive. They often require skill. Plus, academic institutions are often run by people who are much older and, if they have any experience playing video games, it's often relegated to that one time they played Pac-Man in an arcade, when arcades were still a thing. In order to demonstrate the dense academic value of games to those who hold this institutional power, we need to introduce them to games that are not difficult not expensive, and are roughly the length of your average movie. Most importantly, however, they have to be good. In my opinion, one of the best examples of such a game would have to be What Remains of Edith Finch. If you have never played this game, stop watching this video and go check it out immediately. It is very easy to play, it is less than two hours long, and it has a story that seems to be universally loved. It touches on the great mysteries of life, on the questions that human beings will never have answers to, but that we nonetheless puzzle over. Why is the world so filled with tragedy? Not only that, why is it often so random and undeserved? In the face of that immeasurable tragedy, how does one live, if one even chooses to live at all? What Remains of Edith Finch never tries to answer these questions, but presents several scenarios where characters struggle over them. Though some of the scenarios can be heart-wrenching, they are nonetheless totally worth experiencing. After all, it is when we experience these tragedies in our own lives that we often witness not only the best in humanity, but we also develop a greater appreciation for life's beauty. I will provide examples of these tragedies in a few minutes, but before I do, I would like to discuss the core mystery of the game, one that also, beautifully, seems to have no answer. It is by discussing this mystery that we will gain a better appreciation of the tragedies that occur in the game and the profound questions they evoke. Needless to say, there are spoilers ahead. As we already know, the Finch family is famous for what can only be described as a curse. In every generation of the Finch family, all but one family member dies a tragic and sometimes random death. Though in some cases, the cause of death is clear, like when Walter Finch was hit by a train, it's totally unclear in the cases of Molly and Barbara Finch. Above all, what is most unclear is the nature of this supposed curse. One could plausibly view these tragedies as the product of random chance just as much as they could view it as some sort of supernatural force. Whatever the truth may be, it is the mystery surrounding the supposed curse that separates what remains of Edith Finch from other mysterious narratives. Unlike many mysterious stories where, if you dig long enough, you can find a single canonical explanation, you will likely never find a complete answer here. But trust me when I say this, that is the entire point, and it should be that way. The game's creative director, Ian Dallas, said the following on the Finch family's curse, quote, I expect that players will wrestle with their own interpretations of these things. What we found is that another part of weird fiction is that sense of murkiness, your inability to ever really understand what is going on, and not because the truth is being hidden from you, it's a lot worse. Like in H.P. Lovecraft and a lot of other stories, the world is just too complicated or too bizarre for your brain to understand. When I read this statement, I must admit that I felt a little frustrated. After all, much of my channel was built around explaining mysterious narratives. Plus, nobody likes to be left in a state of confusion about anything, right? But I must admit that if things were explained, what remains of Edith Finch would have died off in my memory very quickly. The numinous nature of the narrative would have fizzled, relegating the tragedies to the realm of melodrama. Having said that, I think it is still useful to discuss the nature of the curse because, as I said before, it is in that discussion that the game's true brilliance becomes manifest. 
I will cite two interpretations. One is from another YouTuber, and one is my own. There is a video titled, What Happened to Milton, by a YouTuber named Knuckles Up. In my opinion, he did a really great job explaining not only what happened to Milton Finch, but also the nature of the supposed curse. While I recommend you go watch the video in its entirety so you can listen to all of the evidence he provides, I will summarize here. According to Knuckles Up, the curse can be attributed to hereditary mental illness, specifically schizophrenia. Those with schizophrenia, of course, tend to hallucinate. Sometimes it's as if the products of their imagination cross over into the real world. If we apply this to the characters of Gus, Milton, Edith Sr., Lewis, and possibly Gregory and Edith Jr., things start to make sense. Lewis's imagination seems to overpower him while working at the cannery, leading him to commit suicide by decapitation. After this tragedy, Lewis's psychiatrist tells Don Finch, Lewis's mother, that at one point, he said his imagination was as real as anything else. Edith Sr. relayed a hallucination to Edith Jr. through a diary entry, saying one night she went out to the old Finch house after the tide receded. When she arrived, she saw lights turning on from inside. An impossibility. She also said that her husband, Sven Finch, was killed by a dragon, when in reality he was killed by a dragon-shaped slide that crushed him. There is also a point later on in the game where Dawn tells Edith Sr. not to drink wine along with her medication, further suggesting schizophrenia. Dawn's other son, Milton, went missing and was presumed dead. He, like Edith Sr. and Lewis, was heavily taken up with the products of his imagination. Knuckles Up suggests that his death was brought on by a schizophrenic episode. This perspective is strengthened when you consider what Ian Dallas said about how this game is connected to his previous game, The Unfinished Swan. In a Reddit AMA, Dallas said that the king in The Unfinished Swan is actually Milton from What Remains of Edith Finch. Supposedly, Milton became so taken up with his imagination that he became unable to distinguish between that and reality. If you go with the schizophrenia explanation, it becomes very likely that Milton was in such a delusional state, he might have disappeared by maybe falling into the water during this episode. When you also consider the fantastical things that happen in the cases of Gus, Gregory, Molly, and Calvin, it's difficult to not find the schizophrenia theory attractive. To be honest, I think it's correct. However, I think it's only partially correct. With all due respect to Knuckles Up, I think he overlooked not only the contradictory evidence, but the other equally plausible explanations. Though I think he is right about schizophrenia afflicting people like Edith Sr., Lewis, Milton, and possibly Edith Jr., it does not definitively explain several of the other deaths that occur. For instance, Edith Jr.'s father, Sanjay Kumar, died in an earthquake. Don Finch didn't seem to have any issue with mental illness, but in fact died of an undisclosed physical illness. When she was alive, she was actively condemning Edith Sr.'s imagination, saying that her stories are what killed Lewis and Milton. Sam Finch died by accident after an unfortunate interaction with a deer. Barbara's death doesn't seem to have any link to mental illness, and one could argue that Odin's death doesn't either. Though one could argue that Walter's death was a product of mental illness, maybe depression or agoraphobia, there's no evidence to suggest it was schizophrenia. It's also arguable whether or not Molly Finch's hallucinations were a product of schizophrenia. It's just as possible that after having ingested Holly, toothpaste, and gerbil food, the amount of stress that had on her body caused her brain to hallucinate. Finally, Edith Jr. died in childbirth. With these factors in mind, there is enough reasonable doubt in play that one could explain the curse in other ways. Maybe it is schizophrenia, but it could also be bad parenting, random chance, a combination of all three, or something else. Maybe there is something supernatural going on, where the products of their imagination cross over into reality. Even if one subscribes to the schizophrenia theory, there is always a lingering, uncomfortable suspicion that one might be wrong. And that is what makes the game's narrative so unique. With that said, I would still like to offer my personal interpretation in regards to the nature of the curse. 
Though I do believe there is some degree of truth to the schizophrenia theory, I'd like to offer something else that binds the finches together, making them all susceptible to death regardless of lineage or mental illness. That connection is a rejection of reality. The worst emotional pain that a human being can experience is when a loved one dies. The only thing worse than that is when many of them die, and for random, meaningless reasons. When such tragedy happens, even the strongest among us will seek an escape from the pain of reality. In regards to the Finch family, every character who remains alive after a tragedy engages in their own form of escape. Whether it's through one's imagination, drugs, self-isolation, or simply running away, they will do whatever it takes to make the pain stop. In regards to the Finches, some went as far as to create their own realities, crafting stories that they believed in so much that they might as well have been real. It is through this attempt to escape reality, to escape life, that the curse becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. In some cases, that attempt to escape from reality, that inability to accept death as a part of life will result in a life that was never lived, bringing about a different kind of death, a death of the soul. Paradoxically, it seems that many of the Finches would rather die than accept the tragedy of death as an intrinsic part of life, and no wonder. If you were in Edith Sr.'s position, or Don Finch's position, and your father, husband, brothers and sisters all died, I'm sure many would do more self-destructive things than what those two did in order to cope. Nevertheless, death, like the curse of the Finches, is a fact of life that cannot be escaped. We all know this, yet we rail against it at every opportunity. Some way, somehow, we feel it can be understood and that we can transcend it. But we never do. If we could accept that impossibly tall order, to embrace death as a part of life, to move past our bitterness and resentment towards life's tragedy, we could truly appreciate the beauty that life has to offer, in all its fleetingness. Just as one cannot experience infinite light without infinite darkness to define it, one cannot experience life in all its splendor without experiencing and accepting death. We need to realize, as Edith did at the end of the game, that a thing isn't beautiful because it lasts forever. To use her words, we should be amazed that any of us ever had a chance to be here at all. If Edith Jr.'s son, Christopher, could accept these truths, there is a chance that the curse can be broken, and he may live a more beautiful life than one could ever possibly imagine. If you like this video, please make sure to give it a like, that helps my channel out tremendously. Also, if you want to support my goal of trying to get video games taught in academic settings, please consider supporting me on Patreon. There are six different tiers with multiple rewards to enjoy. If you support me, you'd also be supporting my channel's second core goal, which is, appropriately, mental health and autism advocacy. If you'd like to see more videos on the academic value of games or on mental health, click on one of the videos you see on screen now. Until next time, stay yellow.